a sprawling punk pastiche of reggae, ska, R&B, and rockabilly, The Clash's London calling transcended the band's pub rock roots and resulted in a classic double LP. British favorite since their 1977 debut, the ambitious and politically conscious quartet now sought a global audience. As some of London's last surviving first wave punks, in 1979, The Clash wanted to prove their mettle as a well-rounded rock band and broadcast their message of anti-racism, anti-capitalism, and anti-fascism. Broke and ready to rock, The band holed up in a central London garage with, in Joe Strummer's description, one light and filthy carpet on the walls for soundproofing. Taking its name from the BBC World Service's World War II era station identification, This Is London Calling, the first of four LP sides opened with the title track. Singer and co-writer Joe Strummer announces the album's aggressive politics with a dystopian rant, referencing the nuclear error at Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island earlier that year, as well as the local London anxiety that if the Thames were to flood, most of central London would drown. Strummer's message resonated. The song was a hit at home in the UK and became the band's first single to crack the American Top 30. The rockabilly punk of Brand New Cadillac was completed in one take, declared to be a keeper by producer Guy Stevens. Employing chaos-creating methods, such as throwing furniture around the studio while the band played, the former Mott the Hoople collaborator dismayed the record company, but endeared himself to the musicians. When drummer Topper Heaton asked for another take of Brand New Cadillac, the producer imparted on him the punk rock wisdom that all great rock and roll speeds up. The Guns of Brixton, one of the album's most heavily reggae-influenced songs, was Paul Simonin's own crack at a political call to arms. Growing up in Brixton, the largely Caribbean neighborhood in South London, Simonin channels the discontent brewing beneath his hometown's surface. Presaging the anti-police brutality riots that erupted in Brixton in 1981, Simonin references Ivanhoe Martin, the rude boy anti-hero played by Jimmy Cliff, in the 1972 Jamaican reggae classic The Harder They Come, ultimately gunned down by police. The song would eventually be covered by Cliff himself. When they kick out your front door, how you gonna come with your hands on your head or on the trigger of your gun? While the album is rife with existential angst, their underlying optimism could be heard on Rudy Can't Fail, another ode to the rude boys of Jamaica who are challenging the status quo. The Clash's own anglicized rude boy image was augmented by their promotional tag, the only band that matters. One-time Sex Pistols devotees who rejected the Pistols' nihilism, the Clash mattered because they actually cared. About political issues, about the quality and complexity of their own music, and about their fans, even entering into a protracted battle with their label in order to get the double album priced the same as a single LP. London Calling's final track, and one of its most beloved, Train in Vain, was also the last to be written. Guitarist Mick Jones finished the song in one night, and the band recorded it the following day. With the artwork already en route to the printer, it became an accidental hidden track, scratched into the runoff area at the end of the album's fourth side. A love song with country-western lyrics that echo Tammy Wynette's Stand By Your Man, some see it as an answer to the slit song Typical Girls, written by guitarist Viv Albertine, also Mick Jones's ex, a theory Albertine has corroborated. Like a proto-vision board, the artwork for London Calling referenced a rock stardom far beyond what the clash had yet achieved. Designed by Ray Lowry, its pink and green lettering was an homage to Elvis Presley's first 1956 LP, now framing Penny Smith's instantly iconic photograph of The Clash's Paul Simonin smashing his bass on stage at New York's Palladium. The Clash received nearly universal acclaim for London Calling's deft handling of social and political issues and garnered comparisons to other legendary double albums, like The Rolling Stones' Exile on Main Street and Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde. 
To critics and fans alike, The Clash actually was the only band that mattered. 